Um, and so, yes, I'm Gregory uh, from the Max Planck Institute in Jena. Um, and yeah, I'm going to talk to you a bit about the work we're doing that is also related to this uh, project and that has been done uh, a lot by Daniel Pavon, who's here in the audience, and also Di Xie, who's a, a PhD student with us. Um, yeah, about biophysical impacts of potential changes in tree cover in Africa. And so it's a bit a different take. We've been seeing a lot about land cover change and, uh, and the uh, mapping. And, and here it's a bit uh, more of a derivative of that, uh, the effect that this has on local climate. We know and we focus on Africa. And we've seen this before, this, uh, this figure from uh, Robert Masulele's uh, paper about uh, commodity crops, about deforestation in Africa and things like that. So this is one of the things that's driving the, uh, the interest here. No, we have um, continuing deforestation for, for community, uh, commodity crops. There is also the EUDR that we've hear, been hearing a lot um, in these past days. Um, so about having a regulation for deforestation free products. Um, that's one of another thing that it's changing the dynamics potentially, not yet, but will, the dynamics of what's happening on the landscape. And also you have at the same time a lot of effort about ecosystem restoration. No, it's been, the UN has called this the decade of uh, ecosystem restoration. There's a lot of effort on, in this line, and not only in Africa, but a lot in Africa. There's even companies uh, or NGOs, I, I'm not actually sure if it's a, NGO or not, but just dig it, that is actually promoting a lot of these, uh, what they call boons in dry areas in which you dig these, these, uh, these semicircular uh, uh, bonds of, of earth that actually facilitate the infiltration of water in which you sow grain uh, seeds around it. And so like vegetation grows well on these things instead of being on this um, sealed, uh, sealed soil. And uh, they've been having, showing quite some results on, you know, how this is really having an influence on re-greening things, no? Um, so it's just an example, no, of some things that are increasingly coming around and they are changing a bit the, the landscape. And basically, so on one side, we have these uh, like continuing deforestation effects and also possibly the effect that we'll have about EODR. This will probably make changes in the deforestation dynamics in Africa. And also all these other effort, um, restoration efforts that if they're successful with different levels of success, no, they might increase vegetation cover in general. Both of these aspects will likely increase the heterogeneity of the landscape. And, um, and so we're starting to uh, get more interested about this. No? What would be the local effect on the climate? And to explain a bit what, more what I'm meaning, um, well, first, yeah, this paper that came out just recently, in which I was a bit co-involved, from Jessica Roisch in Wageningen, um, showed actually in, uh, on Africa the potential, how much restoration effort could potentially lead to cooling, biophysical cooling. Um, and this is a bit what, uh, what she shows, no? that uh, it mostly leads to some potential cooling everywhere, locally. <laughs> Um, but what is this, what are we talking about really? Basically, if, when we change the land cover, we're changing not just the surface, but also the properties and the fluxes that come out. So if you see here, um, I mean, if you imagine here a uh, random uh, grassland, you'll have a certain flux of reflected light. Uh, you'll have evaporation and transmitted heat and some carbon uptake, no? And you compare that with a forest in the same area, those fluxes will be different. Typically a forest would, not always, but more generally uh, uh, take more carbon in, but it will be darker. Oopla, sorry, up there. It will be darker, evaporate more water. If it has more access to more water, it might have deeper roots in general. So might be, uh, when you have water, we'll have more. Water and the transmission of heat can be also different because you have more roughness on the surface. You can also notice that I, there is a little cloud on top of these and the cloud on, on the forest is larger than the one on the grasslands. That's another thing that can happen because these fluxes might have an impact on the, on, on, or even on cloud cover. Um, 
And past, part of the work I did before going to Max Planck when I was at the GRC was actually looking at how these things would change and actually seeing that trying to quantify how if you change perhaps management of forest and change from deciduous to needle leaf, this will have an effect on these fluxes in one way. Tropical deforestation may have uh, effects on the, uh, in another way. And we had mapped this kind of effect um, across the globe to say, okay, where are we warming if we change the landscape? Not, so we're not talking about uh, changing the landscape, but what if that landscape would change? Would we expect cooling or warming? The point is that these effects, these fluxes I showed, can be contradicting. In some, one might lead to heating, one might lead to cooling. And so it's not trivial to know where things, how things are happening. And we did this for different IPCC classes um, and uh, across different, uh, different regions. The results are in this paper in land use policy that are mentioned over there. And on top, as I mentioned, there's an effect of clouds. So this is another thing that was not, that is not always also considered, but we, it has been shown that in general, there's many situations in which forestry, forest might induce more cloud formation through different mechanism. The fact that there is more roughness, um, there's also injections of BVOX, which are biogenic volatile organic compounds from forests that can s act as seeding um, mechanisms to, to start clouds. Um, and this was observed by Ryan Teuling um, in this paper also, like on some places in Europe. Then we had other, we, we also did a study to try to quantify this kind of effects. And we saw that in, for example, from June to August globally, we were seeing whether increase in forest cover would increase cloud cover. And we do see a signal that is quite interesting. Um, and so how do we do it? Uh, so I'm gonna explain you a bit how we do it because this is what we're doing in Open Earth Monitor, trying to design, uh, to, to change the, the methodology that we had uh, that, well, I was working on it when I was at the GRC, but now making it more available in an easier way and applying it more to Africa to more complex situations. So basically the idea is space for time substitution. If you have an area like this, and we might have this effect of albedo, so one is brighter than the other, no? Uh, and by brighter, then it might mean that it's cooler. You have this counter effect of evapotranspiration. The forests typically have deeper roots and access to more water, and when they do that, uh, you have um, cooli a cooling effect that is happening at the w when, uh, when water goes into, into the air. Um, and like in tropical areas like this one here, uh, you often expect more of a cooling on the forest and a warming on the on the dry land. Now that we're, we're arguably here, probably it's a place that was forest and has been deforested and changed into cattle or ranching or something like that. And so, and then again, we have this effect that maybe because of that, there's more injection of air uh, of water in the in the column, and then there's more roughness and things like that, you could have more cloud or less clouds nearby. And then comes the satellite. And from the satellite, we can compare a pixel on one side and a pixel, a nearby pixel on the other, control that we're looking at comparable things, which is not always the case, but you, that's the idea, no? that you have to do this work of being doing things comparable and assume by comparison that if that forest becomes that that grassland, the change in temperature that you measure could be a proxy for what it could be when that forest is transformed in a, in a grassland. That, that is basically the baseline of the work. And the ingredients are typically land surface temperature. We have this at, in this case, it's five kilometers from, from Modis and this example. And we have a map and we look in the moving window that you have in red there, observe we don't see it so much. And we have fraction cover maps uh, this is as a CCI, for instance, and you will have one map of forest, of crops, grasses, and others. These add up to 100%. And we're using basically these three things, uh, oh yeah, and it's at five kilometers. We use this, you can assume them in this ternary diagram. So, so for those who did soil sciences, they might like this, this kind of visualization. Basically, you can, put, you can plot all these in a diagram. Um, and the points are, the value of the points, oh sorry, I'm going too fast. 
so basically, since they add up, they can add in this, uh, in, uh, they can be put in this diagram. And, um, and then the, the color of the points is the land surface temperature values. And what you see is that you have a point here of full forest. So this is full forest, this is full grassland, and this is full other. No? And the points, depending on what you have in this window of five by five in this example, they get plotted in this space. And the values are the temperature values that you have here. And here you can see in this example, for instance, that you have darker points here where it's forest and w cooler points here when it's um, full grasslands. And so even though we don't have any full uh, observations of a full forest in our little moving window, we can, by uh, linear regression with some arrangements, because this is compositional data and we need to do some arrangements, we basically can estimate what would be the value of in temperature space going from a full forest to a full grassland um, through, through this method. And then we, do a, we make a map out of it. And we have a value of the change in temperature that we would expect here, and we can specialize that. The result, okay, yeah. Um, and so what are we doing in Open Earth Monitor regarding this? We have a use case um, that was, curiously, it started as a, a proposal for EU land management, land-based mitigation potential tool. So the tool was first thought as something to apply these kind of things for Europe, for a better planning of where to plant forest. A bit Carmelo was showing this uh, a bit earlier. Um, but here, from the point of view of seeing, okay, what, what temperature changes could we expect if we plant a different type of trees in Europe? And our use case was, uh, our, our stakeholder was uh, GRC uh, from the unit uh, with Alessandro Cescati, in which they were interested about all these things. And so the point was, um, yeah, and so the, the focus was first on Europe. However, when we started uh, talking with, the use, uh, with the, our stakeholder partners, the, the, um, what they told us would be that we should try and go further into going to the daily cycle of, of temperature. So because temperatures in the morning and the eve afternoon is quite a different thing, and we should try to target that. If possible, go beyond PFTs and so see tree species maps, which is what Carmelo was doing. So we thought maybe that's a good thing to do at some point. Do various years, but also extend to Africa because it would be interesting of knowing also what's happening be anticipating these things of EUDR and things like that. So that was what they told us in the beginning, and we said, okay, then we might change and focus not only to Europe, but to, to Africa. Also, the solution should be implementable on their platform. They have a big computing platform called BDAP, um, which is used by people in GRC, but also from outside, I mean, collaborations with them. And so basically there, they, they're collecting a lot of data, um, Sentinel-1, 2, uh, I think, yeah, and especially also geostationary data, which is what we wanted to do. Um, and ideally, this should at some point be integrated into their EU forest observatory. They have this forest observatory that is, although it's called EU forest observatory, it's not about observing the EU's forest, it's about observing the world's forest and the impact of EU policy across the world. So again, there was this requirement to go move to Africa, and this is why we actually did so. Now, our task, which is yeah, task 5.15 for those in the project, uh, the, so the progress up to now is that we actually established this partnership and started using their BDAP infrastructure from outside. We adapted the code that was done originally by me before, but that was not ideal. It was run. We adapted it to the Julia language to make it much more efficient and have a reproducible workflow. This is the work that Daniel has been doing uh, um, mostly. Um, we also design a new way, also something that I didn't mention before is the effect of topography. Before, as I told you, we need comparable pixels. So if you have a pixel in the lowland and next to it a highland, then you're, you have a temperature difference just because of the topography. What we, we used to do before was to mask that out and not use those areas where there was changes in topography. Now we designed a way in which we could integrate this explicitly and, and make sure that weights down in the, the regression. And all of that allowed us to make a first test on the GRC cloud platform, um, which is what I'm going to show you quickly here. It's really preliminary also, and we still have a lot to do. We just started this activity not too many months ago. So 
so don't expect magical plenty of uh, plenty of cool figures but basically we have this this is an example for so over the disk so geostationary uh, satellite maybe i should have said a bit more about this so geostationary satellites for those who don't know are really at, at a given orbit where they're always watching the same part of the earth and so they can see they can take images every 15 minutes but they only see a given part of the world so in this case the satellites from europe they're above africa above the equator in africa because to see europe they need to see africa and africa actually it's just even better covered than europe because in europe the pixels are a bit more on the edge of the disk but so it's it's great for africa also to 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 use this and so basically we have information every 15 minutes and we do and so maybe if i can replay this basically this is the image of um ah, the animation doesn't go now oh, okay well um basically here you would have seen the um, the change if we t move from trees to grasses along the time the 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 day how it goes from war uh, from something that is more of a cooling to a warming as you go in the day and the midnight uh, at, mi at noon it's like highest warming and then it warms still a bit and then it goes back down and starts cooling because you have different effects happening in daytime and nighttime um, so it's a it's we have here for now a daily cycle of an average day in August 2018 from Severian on the MSG satellite the idea would be that then and we have still no not done many things on quality filters so there's the signal is a bit salt and pepper, but still you see the general patterns that make sense. And there's probably things that we can do a bit better still by using quality flags. Um, the, yeah, the general patterns are clear, increase in days and falling by night, and it's work in progress. Now, um, the current roadmap is that we are going to be exploring these results first, test quality control, maybe to see if we improve consistency, complete this for different months of the year. So like collapsing everything i mean because it's a lot of data and we might be we don't want to have daily cycles of this necessarily but we want to have an information for to reach uh, the, the effect of one month of one year no monthly and maybe then see if in different years we have different effects that would be probably our main uh roadmap for the year to come we have some opportunities uh, to demonstrate this on a DGGS. Our colleague uh, Daniel Luz will show you what we mean by DGGS, a discrete global grid system, tomorrow uh, in the keynote talks. Uh, basically, it's about moving away from a cube but to, to have hexagons on a sphere and things like that. We might be able to do this within that infrastructure at some point, but that's to be seen. And also, at some point, also talking with Robert Masozelele and people in GFZ, um, we might be able to also adapt this case study specifically for commodity crops also in Africa to see not only trees to grasses but also when we change from a plantation to a forest, a forest to a plantation, how much are we changing the local temperature effects. Um, but then I'm also going to talk to you a bit more about other activities we're doing that is not strictly within this project. Um, using this data from uh, the people at the um, Copenhagen University, where basically they up, 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 they mapped with, I think, mostly planet data, all trees in Africa, or that's how they claim. I mean, probably not all, but uh, but ma basically new techniques to really identify things like you see here. Um, and the point is that yeah, from this data, we have a different description of the of the heterogeneity. I mean, it's one thing is forest, non-forest, or forest grasses. Here we have um, more information about the structure, where the trees are, how they are configured, how heterogeneous they are. And so Dishie is doing uh, her work on this, and she's looking at the effect on, t on clouds again. On, and so here what we're seeing is the effect of tree cover change on cloud cover fraction in daytime and nighttime seeing a sensitivity of like many areas where you see there's more tree co more cloud fraction from these geostationary t satellites the uh, w the more you have tree cover but you have different patterns and when you go through the savanna regions it switches on the other side which is interesting as well at nighttime it's it's different 
and you have also seasonal cycles. Um, so in between between uh, July, um, yeah, June, July, August, or December, January, February, we see the patterns can be a bit different, especially at nighttime, where you see the hem the the seasonality of the two. Um, I mean, uh, yeah, the counter seasonality of uh, in. Of the savannas, now that in one hemisphere, in the southern hemisphere, it's in June, July, August, and northern hemisphere, it's in, in the north. Um, and we're doing this also with heterogeneity. So she she's exploring metrics of heterogeneity from the data set from Copenhagen, seeing like places here in red are more heterogeneous. It's typically the savannas or the miombos down there, in which we're quantifying how trees are assembled, if they're in more compact areas or not compact areas and things like that. But for that, the results, you, you'll have to wait um, to see the, the final result because we're still working on this. But this is what we're going into in general. With that, uh, thank you for your attention and I'm open for questions.